Serial killers in the past have been categorized as organized and disorganized, with the latter kind usually being an uneducated maniac prone to unplanned outbursts of extreme violence. But organized? Well, these smart predators plan ahead. Ted Bundy was one of them, as you shall now see. Bundy sometimes went to great lengths in luring his victims. He embraced a number of techniques to evade arrest, and they worked for a long time. He was the quintessential psychopath. He thought he was one step ahead of the cops all the time. You'll hear later how one of his victims managed to get away after he struck. But for the most part, if someone got in the car with Mr. Bundy, they were not long for this world. It's not certain when he first killed. He might have murdered a girl named Anne Marie Burr in 1961 when he was just 14 years old, but that's inconclusive. He always denied he killed that girl. Still, murder was likely on his mind back then. Homicide detectives that worked on his case agreed that Bundy started young, kidnapping and killing in his teens and early 20s. Those were the years when he tried to perfect killing without being caught. He later admitted that he couldn't control his urges, even though he felt some shame. Using the third person, but really talking about himself, he described what it was like to kill or try and kill in those early days. He felt horrified by the recognition that he'd done this. The realization that he had the capacity to do such a thing or even attempt, that's a better word, this kind of thing. He sat back and swore to himself that he wouldn't do something like that again. Bundy also said on tape that he educated himself in getting away with murder by reading those gory detective magazines that were so popular back then. So with a bit of booze to diminish his inhibitions, he was ready to become the complete product, the epitome of the educated killer. He was 27, he knew the time was right. The victim was 18-year-old Karen Sparks. She was a dance student at the University of Washington. On January 4, 1974, Bundy crept into the basement apartment where she was sleeping. Just before dozing off, though, something had frightened her. Many years later, she recalled, I remember seeing some guy looking at me and thought, gosh, you know, maybe it was just a figment of my imagination because it was so quick. She wasn't imagining things. In fact, she remembered that before she went back to her apartment, she'd been at the laundromat and some guy kept looking at her. When she looked back, he turned his head away. This was most likely Bundy. He'd already become a predator, a kind of human panther that stalks before striking. When he attacked Sparks that night with a metal rod, he did so with so much violence that she should have died. Her injuries were catastrophic, both internal and external. She thinks the only reason Bundy stopped attacking her was that her male roommate in the room next door had talked in his sleep, which he did quite often. Bundy had followed this girl so he would have known she had male roommates, young men that could have easily overpowered him. He likely knew he was taking a risk. The next victim had to be alone and this time she had to die. He didn't even wait for an entire month before he struck again. The victim also studied at the University of Washington. Like the first victim, he didn't so much lure her away. But before we get to his social techniques, we want to give you an idea of his modus operandi. The victim was Linda Ann Healy. Bundy entered her room and beat her until she was unconscious as she was sleeping. He then dressed her in a pair of blue jeans and a white blouse, picked her limp body up and took off. She was discovered missing because that morning at 5.30 a.m. her alarm went off and her roommate noticed that it just kept ringing. Police found blood on her bed and nightgown, but there wasn't much else in terms of forensic evidence. Remember, Bundy at this point thought he was smarter than the cops. He wasn't just addicted to killing, the thrill of the chase afforded him a lot of pleasure. Her skull was later found on a nearby mountain. It would come to light that her apartment was just a few blocks from Bundy's. Again, he had stalked his prey. This time, he made sure there were no burly men staying right next to her. It was then he started employing charm and good looks to find his victims, rather than slaying sleeping women. This time, he went over to the Evergreen State College to hunt. The victim was 19-year-old Donna Gale Manson. He killed those first two women in January and February, and now it was March. It's hard to know the full details about how he lured Manson because of the sad fact that he killed her. Unlike the few survivors that actually talked to Bundy and lived to tell the tale, we can only reconstruct how he manipulated Manson. We know that on March 12th, she stood out in the crowd, wearing a red, orange, and green striped shirt. She was on her way to a jazz concert on campus and she never made it there. In April, he killed again, as if trying to meet a monthly quota. The victim was 18-year-old Susan Elaine Rancourt. It was with her murder that we learned so much more about Bundy's tricks of the trade. There's no doubt that he knew how to come across as a guy people trusted. In junior high school, he sold Christmas tree lights to earn some extra cash. A fellow student from back then recalled, Ted was the best damn Christmas light salesman I've ever seen. He must have used his cool and calm demeanor to abduct Miss Rancourt. She'd been at Central Washington State College in Ellensburg and went missing on her way back to her dorm. What happened exactly, we don't know. But we know that Bundy had previously tried to unsuccessfully pick up other girls at the same college. 
One of them was 21-year-old Kathleen Clara D'Olivio. She told police that she saw Bundy struggling to carry a bag of books. His arm was in a sling, and his hand had a splint on it, which is why he was struggling. She stopped and asked him if he was on his way to the library, and he said, yes, can you please help me? Notably, when she chatted with him, she never turned her back to him. Usually, as soon as that happened, he would strike his victim over the head, rendering them unconscious. Bundy had dropped a bunch of books and was hopelessly trying to pick them up. The Olivia later told detectives we started walking and when we came to a bridge it was obvious that he wasn't going to go to the library. He then said his car was close by. She saw that he had a brown Volkswagen Beetle. Feeling somewhat suspicious of him, she still helped him carry his books to the car. She then thought she'd done enough, put the books down and started to walk off. He subsequently called after her, saying he had dropped his car keys and he couldn't get to him. He asked her for help. She told the cops I was cautious at the time. I mean, even while we were walking, I thought, well, I'm not going to let him get behind me. I'm going to keep an eye on him. She did help him look for his keys, but erring on the side of caution, she said they both should step back and look under the car, rather than bend down in front of him. She outsmarted Bundy right then. They spotted the keys together, and she walked away shouting behind her, good luck with your arm. He must have been furious that some girl had seen right through him, or at least been cautious enough to consider that he might be a sketchy dude. It wasn't the only time he failed to get his prey on that campus. He also tried with a young woman named Jane Curtis. She later told detectives that the man she met was good looking, not someone she thought was freaky or creepy. He looked like a guy you could trust, a wholesome, educated type. She said she bumped into him at about 9 p.m. near the library. She told detectives he had this huge stack of books, like eight or nine books, and he had a cast on his left arm. All of a sudden, he kind of drops them right in the direction I was walking in. She offered to help this injured, handsome fella and politely told her how grateful he was. The two then started walking as they were going in the same direction. She was carrying a bunch of books. She later recalled, He looked at me strangely. His eyes seemed weird. That's because he was looking at someone he thought he was about to kill. He was looking through her, already imagining all the warped things he would do to her dead body. She also noticed that he had a splint over some of his fingers. He told her that he'd been injured in a skiing accident. You see, Bundy made himself look vulnerable for two reasons. One, he knew young women would come to his aid, especially because he was well-spoken and soft on the eyes. Two, a man with a splint and a cast immediately says to a woman that he poses no physical threat. But Bundy operated with more manipulation than that. He could have easily said he had hurt his fingers while building a deck on his house, or when he lifted some weights, or when he was fixing a shelf. But those things he knew very well come across as a bit working class, a bit too masculine. He said skiing because that's what the well-to-do folks enjoy in their free time. Serial killers don't ski, at least in the minds of most people. Back then, the public seemed to labor under the misapprehension that killers should look deranged and walk around with tattoos and shaggy beards. Bundy even drove a feminine kind of car, perhaps the cutest car on the market. He was gaming the public's ignorance, and to some extent, he got one over on the cops too. But he didn't outsmart Curtis. She later told police that little metal thing over his finger looked like it had just been taped on. Still, she walked over to his car, and it was then he told her to open the passenger door because he couldn't do it with his arm the way it was. She refused to open it, so he did. The first thing she noticed was that the passenger seat was missing. That was because it was easier to push an unconscious woman into the car and she wouldn't be seen. Curtis said the missing seat really bothered her, something was just not right about the guy. She told detectives, I had the books in my hand, and he said, get in. I said, what? He said, get in and start the car for me. I said, oh, I can't. He wanted me to get in through the passenger side. Noticing her suspicion, Bundy started to pretend that his arm was suddenly causing him a lot of pain. She'd seen enough though. She left him grabbing his fake broken arm. When she was out of sight, Bundy got in the car and threw off the cast. Again, he must have been furious. Narcissistic psychopaths don't like to be owned. Unfortunately, Miss Manson fell into his trap. Maybe she turned her back on him. Maybe she walked for a while with his books. Maybe she fell for the missing key ruse. We'll never know, but she fell for something. Even though Bundy had failed on occasions, he was smart enough to learn from his failures and was like a killing machine, a machine learning algorithm that gets better each time it kills. Like an algorithm, Bundy felt no remorse. The only important thing was succeeding. We know he kept using that fake sling ruse because when young women went missing, people reported to police that they'd seen a man with his arm in a sling. Some witnesses also saw a Volkswagen Beetle nearby. On top of that, the sketches of this man police made were very close to what Bundy looked like. He wasn't just smart, he was also exceptionally confident. After he'd killed one woman, he went back to the scene of the crime to collect some of her belongings. Police were still everywhere, and he walked right into a crime scene. A detective later said it was a feat so brazen that it astonishes police even today. This was another reason how he got away with so many crimes. He knew his demeanor made him invisible, rather like the character in the book American Psycho, hide in plain sight. 
must have been his motto. But he changed his system up a bit. On other occasions, he swapped the arm in a sling for crutches. A man that couldn't even walk right was way less of a danger than someone with a useless arm. He also carried a briefcase at times because, hey, killers don't walk around with briefcases. This is reminiscent of an educated British drug smuggler who became the first foreigner ever to break out of one of Thailand's worst prisons. Once he got over the wall, he opened up an umbrella. Getting the umbrella over with him was very hard, but it was worth the trouble. When he was asked why he did it, he replied, because escaped prisoners don't use umbrellas. Bundy was an expert at exploiting people's preconceptions. Moreover, when he told people he worked for the assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Commission, who could believe he was a killer? It was true, too. He actually wrote a booklet aimed at women when discussing how to avoid dangerous men. His temerity knew no bounds. Time and again, he lured women to his car. One time in broad daylight, that day he wore a tennis outfit because, again, what kind of killer looks like he could almost pass as Jimmy Connors. Bundy also moved around a fair bit, which made police work across states very hard before massive computer databases came into existence. He was well aware of what we now call linkage blindness. That's when crimes are not connected. He became a law student, which was a great pickup line, especially when he had those good looks, too. Many people who met Bundy on a night out were literally charmed to death. They only really became his lovers after they were dead. Still, Bundy often returned to his tried and tested being injured canard. If it's not broken, why fix it, he might have told himself. One time in Colorado, he approached a victim on crutches and asked her to help him carry his heavy ski boots. She was dead soon after. He dumped her and went back to her decomposed body six weeks later. There was one exception, though. The only woman who ever got in his car and actually survived. This was nothing short of miraculous. Like waking up next to a lion only to find it's cooked you breakfast and put your phone on charge. Her name was Carol DeRanche. She was in a shopping mall in Salt Lake City, Utah when a good-looking, smartly dressed man walked up to her. He introduced himself as a detective and said he needed to know her car license number. Bundy, sly as ever, started looking around the mall. He told the woman he was just trying to see where his partner was. She fell for it. He told her there'd been quite a few car break-ins down at the mall car park. Would she go down to the car park with him just so he could ascertain if she'd been one of the victims? Phew, she thought, when the two realized her car had been left alone. But Bundy said he still had to file a report. It was just a few minutes' drive to the station. He said she could go with him in his car, although she became somewhat suspicious when she saw the police car was actually a Volkswagen Beetle. Beetle in name, Beetle in nature. What kind of cop drives such a slow car, she thought. Unfortunately, Durant was quite a naive person. She had not seen the ways of the world having grown up in a rural Mormon community. Her parents had always told her to show the utmost respect toward authority figures. She did. However, she still thinks the Beetle was a bit weird, and that's why she asked Bundy to show some ID. Yet again, the psycho was able to think on his feet. He quickly flashed his wallet up to her eyes, and she didn't have the confidence to tell him she didn't really see much. She got in the car. Bundy said, strap up, and that's when she smelled booze on him. Now things really didn't seem right. When they were alone on a quiet road, Bundy stopped the car. The ranch was now scared. She could still smell the alcohol vapors wafting around the car. For a moment, there was an awkward silence as Bundy just looked forward through the windshield. He then turned on her, snarling as he did. He clipped on some handcuffs, only in his hastiness, he fastened them onto the same hand. Durant tried to get out of the car, at which point Bundy smacked her on the back of the head with a crowbar. She screamed, punched, kicked out, landing a blow right in Bundy's fiendish face. Durant got out of the car and left the bloodied Bundy in her dust. One thing she told police later was that he hardly said a word to her while they were driving. When being interviewed in prison, Bundy explained why he was a man of few words when it came to his victims. He said he never wanted to know any personal details about them. That was because it was hard to kill someone once they became a little too real. This wasn't about empathy, but the fact that them becoming real would wreck his fantasy. According to some experts on serial killers, if you ever find yourself up close and trapped by one of them, start talking and make sure you become as real as can be. It probably won't work, but it's about the best chance you'll have. Now you need to hear the full story how they caught serial killer Ted Bundy. Or have a look at this.